Aren't you thankful that we come to worship a God who's trustworthy? A few of us? I don't know about you, but one of the constant questions I have in my interactions with people every single day is, can I trust this person? Right? We live in a world where, I mean, I don't ask that of my wife every day. I know that, but we live in a world where we read an article on the internet. We don't know if it's trustworthy. We, we watch a political ad. We don't know if it's trustworthy. We interact with somebody who needs help or we, we want to pour into their life. We don't know if they're just scamming us, but I, I, it is so amazing to know that every time I come to the Lord, I don't have to wonder if he's trustworthy. When I read a promise in his word, I don't have to wonder if it's still true. So good. So good. I hope you have, were blessed by that time as we just could tell God we trusted him. And if you say, well, I'm really not right there right now, that's okay. He's okay with that. Your lack of trust doesn't make him untrustworthy. All right. So I feel like before we jump into our sermon, there's, there's a, a PSA that I've been wanting to do for a while, public service announcement, about the nature of preaching. So I, no, Some of us grew up in this church in, in, in Baptist circles. Some of us grew up in this church not going to church. We grew up not going to church, excuse me. We grew up, some of us grew up in Pentecostal circles. Some of us come from the vineyard movement, a little more lively than our Baptist friends, right? So um, there's a whole lot of difference in this group. Some of you are sitting right now, sitting here thinking, if you tell me to raise my hands, I'm leaving, right? So let's just keep the PSA today to the, the, the nature of preaching and the purpose of it in the church. Preaching is not a solo sport, all right, preaching becomes very dry and boring and really doesn't get the point if it is a solo sport. We have come here today to preach, and that is simply to proclaim good news, right? And we all play a part in that. So when good news is proclaimed that resonates within our soul, it's okay to say, hallelujah! JD's like, not today. <laughs> it's okay to agree. It's okay to say yes. It's okay to say amen. It's okay to say, all right! Right, like... I don't know about you, but when I watch TV, particularly sports, when I agree with whatever is going on, I'm very vocal about it. Or when I'm watching the Lions or the Pistons or the Tigers or the Red Wings, I'm very vocal about my disagreement with what is going on. Now, for the, this public service announcement about preaching, if you have disagreements, you may be quiet. But if you have <laughs> agreements... I want to encourage you. I think we are here to proclaim the spoken word. And, and, and it is not from me to you. It is from us to ourselves. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I realize the importance of proclaiming to myself good news every single day. Because my mind generates a lot of bad news. And the devil, who's a jerk and a thief, walking around like a roaring lion, he comes and he gives me a lot of bad news. And the only way that I can get through the day is to constantly proclaim to myself good news over and over again. And so that is our, our mandate today, our mission today, to proclaim some good news. To encourage ourselves as we head back out into the mission field this week, striving to live the kingdom life so others may see our faithful and trustworthy God, right? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7 as you prepare to participate today. We recently moved my grandma from her, her house. You know, my grandpa passed away four months ago, and my grandma is 92 years old um, and still going strong, especially that stubborn streak, right? Anybody got a grandma like that? And... Uh, we recently just moved her into a, a, a place just a few miles from here. And, and I had the thought as I was driving her there on Friday, hey, you know what, like, maybe we could pick you up and bring you to our church. And then I realized Grandma wouldn't like our church. And so um, she would be shaking her head with that, that PSA right now. But anyway, it's okay. I'm so thankful we live in a world with with different expressions, right? I mean, I'm thankful, and at the same time, it frustrates me that the church is so divided, but I'm thankful that, like, it's not, there's not one way. Jesus is the one way, and beyond that, how we come to him through the Spirit is up to us, right? 
enter through the narrow gate and just keep coming. Matthew chapter 7. I got to jump in because I should have waited to start my time for my sermon until now. We are rounding, wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount. And if you were here last week, uh, we came to the conclusion of Jesus' teaching into what kingdom life looks like. And he, and he gave us some instruction on how to get in. Right? And he said, enter through the narrow gate. It's all about me. <laughs> you, you can come into this kingdom life one way and only one way. You can try to do it your, 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 the moral way or the religious way. You can try to do it the prideful way, but it's never going to work. It's just going to result in destruction. There's only one way into this kingdom life, and it's through me. And now he ushers or, or, or encourages us with two warnings. Two warnings are the next part of this that I think we need to take seriously today. Now listen, these verses have been used and misused and abused by many, many people proclaiming good news, and they have caused us, many good-meaning, well-intentioned people, to question whether or not we're actually in the kingdom life. And that is not the goal today, although we will end there. Let's jump in. What are we talking about? The title of our sermon is called Watch Out. There's a kingdom life. There's only one way to enter into it. Make sure you enter in that way. And, and as, you're, as you're going about that, watch out. There's a couple things to consider. There's a couple things to be warned about. And that's where Jesus starts in verse 15. Follow me. I'm going to read through the text and then we'll come back and walk through it after we read through the whole thing. Matthew 7, 15 through 23. Watch out. If you're wondering where the sermon title came from, it's Jesus's. Don't get mad. He's okay with plagiarism. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, meaning it, it's missing its purpose. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, in your Bibles, there's probably a paragraph heading that goes to the next section, which you're probably more familiar with, because most of the time we quote these verses without the first verses, but the reality is Jesus didn't pause. He's not referencing a second group of people. He's still dealing with fruit and telling us to watch out. And he says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, those of you who do evil things, you evil doers. The title of our sermon is Watch Out. Jesus begins this warning telling us to watch out for faults prophets. What is a prophet? A prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God, right? It's someone who speaks as if it was the voice of God in the Old Testament, right? Now, one thing we need to point out, as, as we examine this text about 2,000 years after it was spoken, we now have something that makes it easier for us to watch out for false prophets than they did, right? And we hold it in our hands, okay? We believe that in our hands is the completed revelation of God, His Word, it's inspired by God. It is true, not just parts of it, not just the parts we like, all of it. It is the standard. It is the guide. It's, it's kind of easy, in a sense, nowadays to, to identify those who are false prophets because they don't preach what's in here. But could I maybe just propose, there may still be some false prophets who may preach what's in here, but Jesus is warning us about following them, Right? But he says, watch out for false prophets. Watch out for those who speak on behalf of me that are not really of me. They come in sheep's clothing. Well, that should be easy to recognize. <laughs> Look around. That's not what he means, right? If any of you went and saw the Shrek play uh, for, that the high school did at Cedar Springs, as I was studying this text this week, I just saw the big bad wolf <laughs> in the dress. Anybody? No? Okay, sorry. I thought it was hilarious. 
We have some talented students in this, in this church. Maddie and Kat and Anya and Nathaniel. Amazing. Luke, you were part of it. There's a lot of students. I'm, if I forgot someone, I don't, I'm going to get in trouble now. I shouldn't have started naming names. They'll come in sheep's clothing. What does that mean? They're, they're, they're going to look just like a real one. They're going to try to act just like a real one. Like it's, it's going to be hard to tell who these false prophets are, right? So, so listen, the warning, the instruction he just gave us was enter by the narrow gate. Every other gate leads to destruction. Now be on guard because there's going to be some people who try to deceive you from the narrow gate. And try to preach a wide gate as if it's part of the narrow gate. Like, be on guard for people who speak on behalf of God who aren't really of God. Now, this doesn't just have to be a preacher or a televangelist. Oh, he's talking about those TV preachers. No, he's talking about anybody who speaks on behalf of God who really has not entered through the narrow gate. Anybody who tells you this is what God wants you to do, but they are really not part of the kingdom of God. They may look like it. They may talk like it, we're going to see. They may even act like it, but be careful. They come in sheep's clothing. They look like they have good intentions, but really they're a wolf. Now, this would have been an analogy that Jesus' hearers would have understood. Most of them were caught up in farming or, 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 or shepherding, right? And wolves did nothing good to anything that they were trying to do. A wolf... When you saw a wolf, it wasn't just like, oh man, I hope he goes and, and eats those sheep and not mine. No, if you saw a wolf, it was a community effort to get the wolf out. Because the wolf will damage and destroy our livelihood. And so when Jesus says they look like a sheep, but they're really a wolf, what he's saying is danger! Danger! They will wreck your kingdom life. They will distract you. They will destroy you. Well, if we can't tell what they, who they are by how they look, what do we do? And then Jesus goes into the point of this whole text. Look at their fruit. Anybody bring fruit with them today? Do you ever, do you ever I, don't, I don't know. So sometimes we've been in church so long, we just read things and think everyone knows what it's talking about. What? Is everyone going to be carrying a banana or an apple? Like, what, what, what are you talking about, Jesus? <laughs> like, what is fruit? Fruit here in this text really is the byproduct of someone's life, church. It's not something we carry with them. It's something that flows out of us. It is the byproduct of, of our confession. It is the proof of whether or not we've actually entered the gate we say we've entered into. What Jesus is saying here is that you enter through the gate, that's faith in Jesus, but the proof that you entered through the right gate comes in what your life does. And you can't fake that. You can't hide that. Fruit is the byproduct of our lives. And now one thing he tells us in here is this, a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. It can't be the other way around. If my tree is good, it will bear good fruit. If my tree is bad, it will bear bad fruit. So he's not really even focusing on fruit here. He's focusing on the condition of the tree, which I would argue goes back to what gate have you entered in through? Stay with me, okay? We're going to get somewhere, I promise. He continues in verse 21, basically says, talk is cheap. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to get in. It's a sad reality to think, church, that not everyone who professes the name of Christ actually believes in the person and the work of Christ. People use the name of Christ for their own gain, for their own benefit, What he's saying is talk is cheap. So as you watch out for these false people speaking on my behalf, what they say is cheap. Can I just tell you, uh, give you a confession of a church kid here? I knew how to talk the talk my entire life. I actually lied on my college admission form to go back to Bible college so that I could get out there to get away from all my friends who I was doing stupid things with. I wrote down all the things that I knew I was supposed to say, I wake up every morning and I have quiet time. That's like, woo, this dude's spiritual. I pray the Lord's Prayer. Woo, ding, ding, ding. Right? Now, God works all things together for good. I'm not justifying my lie, but he did get a hold of my heart and he did get a hold of my life and I met my wife and so I'd lie again. 
That didn't sit well with some people. What I mean is, like, we can talk the talk. Anybody else good at it? Some of us did it this morning. How has your week been? Oh, I'm just so blessed. I mean, 10 minutes ago, you were telling your husband or your wife that you wish they never would've, you never would have seen them because they can't get the kids ready on time. Right? You're questioning your decision of why you had all these children. Some of you are wondering why God gave you those parents. Why we're going to this place today. How are you doing? I'm just so blessed. Man, we can talk the talk. How was your time with the Lord this week? So good. So good. Yeah, man, just, just still just chewing on that sermon from last week. So good. Lord, I just want to bless you, Lord. I do it too, and I come to work here every day. Not every day, I take a day off. Don't call me on it, but we do it, don't we? And, and, and so what Jesus is trying to get to here is talk is cheap. If some of you are waiting for the three points, don't worry, there's only one today, and we'll get to it at the end, all right? So just calm down. I didn't fill out your sermon notes, so I didn't even look. If there's blanks in there, um, they're wrong. All right. Talk is cheap. Be careful evaluating people by what they say. Uh, The second thing he tells us here is good deeds are cheap. Look at the list of what some of these false prophets do. These false people who speak on God's behalf. These, you could even say false ambassadors to give us a little bit of context in where we're going. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Whew! And in your name drive out demons. Anybody do that this week? These are super Christians right here, man. These are, these are legit people. And in your name, perform many miracles. We did a lot of things. And Jesus is clear. Then I will tell them plainly, I, I, don't, I don't know you. I, actually, I never knew you. See, our talk is cheap, but so are our good works that are done for the purpose of simply doing good things. As we, uh, as we wrestle with this idea of entering through the narrow gate, it's really hard for us, church, to not let our mind go to, if you grew up in church, where it's always gone my entire life. I entered through the narrow gate, and now what? I just have to do all of these good things. Don't drink, smoke, or chew, or date girls that do, right? That was my grandpa's phrase all his life. I need to go to church twice on Sundays. I need to stop swearing as much. We added that part, right? Some of you. So I can see a couple smirks. I'm going to call you out. Some of you were like, thank you. We need to probably give our money. We need to hope we don't come to church when they say we need more nursery workers because we probably got to do that too to be good Christians. We begin to add all these things can't flip people off when I'm driving anymore. I could cross them, though. Give them the cross, right? <laughs> Try that sometime. We begin to add all these things that we're supposed to do. Can I just encourage you what I think? And, 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 and I could be off on this. You got to test this. I don't think I am. I think what Jesus is saying is, Be careful once you've entered through the narrow gate because there's going to be a whole lot of people trying to tell you God wants you to do something different. And you're not going to be able to tell if they're real by what they say, by what they look like, or even by what they do because they may do some of the right things. It's actually what he says, he who does the will of my Father who is in the kingdom. Well, let's stop there for a second and ask, what is that? See it down there? Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, that brings the question, what is the will of the Father? Jesus said over in John chapter 6, verse 40, my Father's will is, oh, thank you, Lord, for answering. My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. What is the will of the Father? The will of the Father is that we would know and believe in Jesus and that we would live the life that he came to give us for all of eternity. I 
I think he's still talking about the narrow gate. And our temptation to listen to people who will take us away from the narrow gate. So let's just stop and recap for a second. There's a narrow gate and there's a wide gate. If you come through the narrow one, it's life. If you come through any other way, it's just going to result in death and destruction and misery. Enter through the narrow gate, it's Jesus. But watch out because there's a whole lot of people that will try to distract you from that narrow gate. They may actually look normal. They may actually say the right things and they may actually do some of the moral deeds that you're trying to do. But they're wolves. They're not true. So that gets us to where we're going today. How do I know if I know? Now there were two reactions to the scripture, the scripture we just read. I'm not going to label them because I don't know your heart, but I know what my heart does. The first one is when I begin reading about true and false prophets, I start finding myself with what I would call righteous anger over all those false prophets who have led people astray. And I begin to think about, that's this guy. That's this girl. That's her. That's my Sunday school teacher. Wolf. And then I wish that there was a ministry we, we could create, create for big, strong dudes that just beat up wolves. In the name of Jesus. Right? That's just my pride, I'm going to be honest with you. Or there's a second route that I tend to hope I take more often. I look at myself and I say, how do I watch out so I don't become one of those who proclaims to speak the voice of God, but I've missed it. See, I think that's the temptation in this life. We're, we're going to get next week to, to how to build our house. But before we build our house, we've got to make sure that we actually believe the right things. Right? We've got to make sure we've actually gone through the, the narrow gate. So how do I know if I know... There's one point for our sermon today, and it's this. This is what I think the point of Jesus' message here is. The fruit reveals the condition of the tree. The fruit reveals the condition of the tree. Watch out. It'll get really easy to begin identifying and labeling people based on something else, but what you need to be on guard for is to examine the fruit. Now, what I want to challenge us to do in the last 13 minutes we have together is this. Let's do the hard work today of not looking at the speck while ignoring the plank. What do I mean by that? It'd be really easy to apply this to everybody else. It'd be really easy to start being a fruit inspector for my spouse right now. Mine's not here. So I can re-preach this however I want. It'd be real easy to take some notes down so I can let my kids know about the fruit in their life that needs to sh shape up. It'd be real easy to think about my mother or my father who may have let me down and professed to know Jesus and I wanted to examine their fruit. But let me just challenge us this morning to do the hard work of just examining our fruit. If what Jesus is saying to us is this, the fruit reveals the condition of the tree, then that means we need to make sure that the fruit that is in our life We've examined it to know what the condition of our tree is, right? And so let's just jump to um, Galatians chapter 5. Because I don't want to make up a list of all the fruit I think should be here or should not be here. Because that's dangerous, right? You did not come here to hear my thoughts this morning. If you did, they will lead you straight to hell. You need to come here to hear the word of Jesus, right? So the beauty of the Bible that we have is that it all works together. It all correlates. It all goes to the, points to the same gate being Jesus. And so we can find from other places maybe what we can use to examine ourselves. If the fruit reveals the condition of the tree, let's just look at what Scripture labels here as some bad fruit. That might help us to know the tree's in, in, a, in a rough spot, and then we'll talk about what we need to do to fix that. Please, you are not going to leave here today being like, oh boy, that was, that was great. I got so much bad fruit, I'm terrible. No, 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 that's not the gospel. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 is where we're going to start reading. 
This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia, believers. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit is what he's saying, right? And if you do that, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Good and bad. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then here he gets to, here are the acts of the flesh. So there's the flesh and the Spirit, if you want. You could say good and the bad, the bad and the good. And they're they're in conflict with each other. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. And then he gives us a list. Here are the works of the flesh. Here is the bad fruit. If you don't walk by the Spirit, if you don't enter through the narrow gate, if you don't rely on Jesus, then here is the bad fruit. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Oh great, a list we don't even understand. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. They've, they've, they're, they're coming through the wrong gate. It's a bad tree because the fruit's not looking good. Let's just walk through that list, and I promise I'm not going to take forever harping on these Sexual immorality, actually in the original language, both the word for adultery and um, the word pornea is here, which is usually translated sexual immorality, basically meaning this is a bad fruit. Any sexual activity outside of the boundary lines defined by God. We can make this real simple. What is the boundary lines that God has defined that sex is a very good thing within the bounds of a husband or wife, eternal covenant, committed relationship, covenant under him, right? One man, one woman, like, if you're married, like, it's okay. That would have been a good spot for an amen. Thank you. Like, God made everything else and said it's good. God established marriage, and by, na- by definition, then sex, and said it's very good. Like, that's not my words, that's him. Anything outside of that, in addition to, before, after, someone else who's not in it is sin. And if we choose to engage in that, it's bad fruit. Impurity and debauchery are the next list here. This is just living in a lustful way, a shameful way, always wanting, always coveting things that we shouldn't have, always thinking impure thoughts. It tends to more refer to a sexual way, sexual shame. Idolatry and witchcraft is bad fruit. This is just reverence or devotion to anything other than God. That's idolatry. Reverence or devotion to anything other than God. Putting anything other than God before God. That could be my job. That could be my spouse. That could be my possessions. Or it could be another false deity. Right? That's where witchcraft comes in. Witchcraft is just the byproduct of adultery as it is pursuing power that doesn't come from God. I had a joke about essential oils right here, but I'll let it go. Oh, sorry. All right. It got a little heavy for a second. Hatred is the next thing. What is hatred? Bad fruit of hatred. Well, I don't hate anybody. I just don't like some people. No, listen, hatred should be defined like this, the opposite of love. Jesus never gives wiggle room. He never says there's three categories, love, hate, and then this middle spot where you can live in where you're just annoyed beyond belief by everybody in the world and you don't have to ever serve them. He says there is love and there is hate. Hatred is anything that I do that is the opposite of love. Anytime I am selfish, anytime I am angry, we're going to talk about that. It all comes because I'm not loving. I'm, I, I'm choosing to, to be bitter or not forgive someone. It's, it's hatred. Choosing to not treat someone the way I want to be treated is hatred. See, love is pursuing what is best for them, even at my expense. Well, what if they don't deserve it? Well, now you're getting in the territory of living out the love of God. Because no one deserves God's love. But he freely gives it day in and day out, right? 
Let's keep moving because our, our goal is not to get caught up on this list. Discord. Discord is just arguing or fighting or conflict. You don't have to look long. Just go on Facebook to find out that we love Discord. We love to argue. I think if we could take one word from this message, it would be keep scrolling. Right? Or better yet, shut it off. Well, they said something dumb. So did you, but I kept scrolling. Right? We all do. There's something inside of us that loves to argue, that loves to have conflict. To love to disagree. Another bad fruit is jealousy, he says here. Seeking to surpass and outdo others. That's, that's jealousy. I mean, Johnny down the block, he just bought a pretty sweet lawnmower. Babe, I think we need an upgrade. Seeking to surpass and outdo others. That's jealousy. Is there someone in your life who you look at and think, oh, I want to be better than them? That's, that's jealousy. See, love rejoices in others' accomplishments. Selfish ambition. Oh, I skipped one. Fits of rage. <laughs> it's interesting I skipped that one. <laughs> right? Literally, the word here is wrath. It's the outpouring of our anger, the result of our hatred. The NIV doesn't actually include this in the list, but in the original language, murder is actually included in verse 21 that would fit under this. Fits of rage that result in the ultimate expression of hatred, killing someone. The outpouring of our anger. It's not a good fruit. Selfish ambition. Pursuing what's best for you with no regard for others. I don't care what this does for everyone around me. It's best for me, and I'm going to do it. That's selfish Ambition, we are plagued with bad fruit at times. Dissensions, stirring up and causing quarrels and discord and division. Factions, factions are the same as dissensions, only in religious communities. So there's a different word for it if you're going to do it in your church as opposed to if you're just doing it in the community. But both of them are wrong. <laughs> Stop causing drama. There's a phrase in our house that Ruth doesn't like, but I always say, save the drama for your mama. Actually, save it for nobody. Envy. Envy is a feeling of discontent over another's advantages, successes, or possessions. Envy leads to thinking that a person is not worthy of having what they have because that you feel like you are more deserving. You ever, you ever do that? <sighs> Joe just got a new truck. He ain't even that good of a husband. I'm a good husband, and I drive a Volvo. What's up with that? Right? Can, I, can, can, can I give you a little bit of an insight into the, the wickedness of so, temptation of my tree to be bad? I walked into a church last Thursday. Let it remain nameless. It's much bigger than ours. They had a foyer that you could actually stand in. Um, and my first thought was, I don't think the pastor here is more holy than me. It's envy. It's, it's not good fruit. It reveals that my heart probably wasn't in the right place. I'll tell you how to fix it in a second. I just want you to know I struggle with it too. Drunkenness. Drunkenness usually refers to alcohol, but inclu could include any mind-altering drug. Anything that we do that results in a lack of self-control, right? Being under the control or the influence of something else. Dependency. Orgies. Letting loose of inhibitions and good judgments. Parents, you're welcome. I was just going to say, ask your parents what that is, but I actually defined it. And then he says the like, literally things like this. So he, he's built a list. This is bad fruit. If these things are evident in your life, it is, it is not good. People who live in this, people who continually practice this, people who live for this, people whose lives are marked by this will not inherit the kingdom of God. No, bad tree, bad fruit, wrong gate. But then he gives us some good fruit. Let me just correct us from the beginning. These are not the fruits of the Spirit. These are the fruit of the Spirit. Meaning this is the picture of what it looks like when the Spirit lives through you. And I'll, I'll tell you why I said that in a minute. We're going to come back to it. Love. 
The word here is agape, literally self-giving, self-sacrificing love, pursuing what is best for others, giving of yourself for the benefit of others, treating someone according to the value that God has given them. That is agape love. That means that we look past someone's actions, past someone, our, our, some of our interactions, to the value that God has given them. That means that when I treat someone a certain way, I treat them according to the way God sees them, regardless of how they act. That's love. It's not just a good thing for your marriage. It's a good thing for your parenting. It's a good thing for your church relationships. It's a good thing for kingdom life. And if the tree is good, then love will be present. Joy, gladness that is independent of one's circumstances or feelings. See, we confuse joy and happiness a lot. We're happy a lot as a church. We're not joyful. How do I know? Because in my life, as soon as things change that were making me happy, all of a sudden I'm unhappy. And how do I express my unhappiness with anger and discord and fits of rage? Anybody else? Let's keep moving. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It's good fruit. It is confidence in the wisdom and the sovereignty of God. It's the ability to let the world fall apart around you, but you literally are still okay on the inside. See, here's the reality. God is in control. God is still in control. It does, it, not that it doesn't matter, but listen, regardless of what happened in your life this week, God is still on the throne. He didn't wake up on Wednesday and think, what in the world, how did I fall off of that? Whoa, I didn't see that one coming. I didn't know his business was going to tank this week. I didn't know they're going to repo the car this week. Oh, what am I going to... No, peace comes because we trust. And it's not easy. But when we walk through the narrow gate, it's there. Patience. <laughs> forbearance is the word in the NIV. Patience is the idea. Uh, I, I love the definition of patience. It's just literally to suffer joyfully. <laughs> King James gets it right. Long suffering. When does it just get easy? Never. It's just you learn to suffer with joy. I mean, we live in a world that's broken and marred by sin. We live in a world where our decisions and others' decisions bring things that we don't want in our lives. And guess what? That the patience means we just suffer along full of joy. Not trying to push things. Not trying to get our way. Let's keep moving because kindness, a sympathetic attitude towards others and a willingness to do good. I shouldn't, probably shouldn't. I've probably confessed enough, but um, this week I came up behind somebody at a stoplight, stop sign, and it took them a long time to go, like two and a half seconds. Anybody else? Right? Helen just got her permit this week, and she says to me, Dad, you and Mom are totally different. Mom's like, if you're comfortable, it's okay. And you're like, go! <laughs> just so you know, she drives like me, <laughs> so... But I came up behind this person, and they weren't going. And I thought, get out of the way! Right? Anybody else? And so I went around them. I did. I just went around them. Halfway around, I realized their car's not running. You know what my first thought was? <laughs> That's a crappy day for that to happen. And I turned left, and I kept going. And then the Lord said, Kevin, what are you doing? And I pushed on my brakes, and I saw they got their car started to move, and I said, hallelujah! Ah, I don't have to do it. Then the very next day, I was walking, and it was, it was actually, the next day was Sunday, and there was snow coming down, and this person was walking. I wasn't walking. I was driving. And this person was walking, and I remembered kindness. And so I did a UE and came back and asked if they wanted to ride, and I literally got treated like I was a perpetrator trying to steal a child. And I thought, what am I supposed to do, Lord? Can't go around them, can't pick them up, right? But here's the reality. No, they did not get in. They did not get in, and Helen says, Daddy probably thought you were a creeper. 
Well, do I just follow him to make sure he gets home right now? I don't know what to do, right? No, I didn't. I just went on. But listen, here's my point. I don't know why I told you all that. <laughs> Kindness is a sympathetic attitude towards others and a willingness to do good. It, it means I'm not, I'm not frustrated by the inconvenience of my life to be generous towards somebody. Faithfulness, the character of one who can be relied upon. Oh, I skipped goodness. Goodness is just integrity, honesty, transparency. Faithfulness, the character of one who can be relied upon. Oh, I'm so thankful God is faithful. Every day I wake up, he's the same. I want to be like that. Gentleness, meekness, humility. Gentleness really is strength under control. Then self-control, the ability to control your impulses, one who doesn't give in to their desires and their passions. There's no law against these things. So what's the point? Here we got good fruit, here we got bad fruit. Now listen, I'm going to guess if you're like me as we walk through that list, your first thought is, oh my goodness, I've got some bad fruit in my life. So what's the point? Four action steps. Number one, first, back it up. Let's enter through the narrow gate. If you're in this room, please do not hear this list and think it's all about what I have to do. It's all about how I act. No, listen, there is one way into kingdom life. There is one way into eternal life, and that is through Jesus. That is through faith in his death and his resurrection and through following him. There's no other way. You're not going to get there any other way. So let's not get that twisted as we talk about all this fruit. Enter through the narrow gate. That's where it starts every single day. Who do I rely on? To walk through, walk in kingdom life through. Jesus, that's where it starts every day. There has to be a decision once and for all that I'm going to enter in this gate. So please don't get it twisted after hearing that list. Action step number two, don't listen to everyone who speaks on God's behalf. Let me just say this. We're going to come back to where we were at, but don't. Just because someone's a preacher, just because someone holds a Bible doesn't mean they're true. What Jesus is telling us is this. The fruit tells the story. So that gets us to action step number three. Examine your fruit. Here's what I want to just challenge us to do. What kind of fruit's in my life? Am I marked by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control? Or am I marked, marked more, more by anger and dissension and faction and adultery or for sexual morality or what is my life marked by? I'm not, I'm not talking about like, hey, you know what? On Wednesday, there was, there was, I started to see some bad fruit. I'm talking about what is your life marked by? What are you living in? What are you walking in? You can't argue with the fruit. Well, no, Kevin, I'm a good tree. Just for the last two and a half years, I've had bad fruit. No, like that is somebody in danger. You need to examine Examine your fruit. Where am I at? And that brings us to our last action step and the point as we close. What do I do if I don't like the fruit that I see? Action step number four. Live in the relationship that Jesus died to give you with the Father. Enter through the narrow gate. Here's the temptation if you're a believer in this room. We walked through that list and you saw a few things that you need to cut out of your life and you saw a few things that you want to add. Can I challenge you to resist the temptation today to do better at certain fruit? That's not the point. How do I know if the tree is good or if the tree is bad? It comes down to the fruit. So if we need to change the fruit, we don't need to focus on the fruit. We need to focus on the tree. Well, how does a tree be made good? Enter through the narrow gate. What do I mean by that? It's all about Jesus. See, the fruit of the Spirit was never meant to be a checklist of things we need to add to our life. It was always meant to be a picture of what it will look like if we just live abiding in Christ, if we live day by day walking in the Spirit, if every day we get up and we find ourselves at the foot of the cross saying, I cannot do this today. I cannot get it right on my own. Here I am, God. I don't need to be better. I just need more of you.
I'm going to close with this. In, in, in the Old Testament, there was the story of uh, the children of Israel being affected by poisonous snakes. Remember that? And so Moses was told to fashion a serpent, put it on a pole, and when they looked to that snake, they would be healed, right? That, that, that happened in, 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 I believe, in Exodus, right? And then years later, when the Apostle John is writing the Gospel of John, he tells us, remember that serpent in the wilderness that all you had to do was lift up your eyes and look to, and as you did that, you would be healed? Remember that serpent? Actually, that's a picture of Jesus. And so, just lift up your eyes and look to the sun and you'll be healed. What's the point? The fruit reveals the condition of the tree. Well, how do I make sure my tree is good? Look to the sun. Stop trying to do more and just rest in the relationship that you have with Jesus. You're like, man, Kevin, that's, that's, like, I need some things to do. You can't. You can be better, but until you abide in Christ, the fruit's never going to change. Until I learn that daily I am destined for depravity without the, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the strength of the power and the person of the Holy Spirit living in my life. I can't do it. And so I don't need to get up tomorrow and try to be more loving. I need to get up tomorrow and be more surrendered. I don't need to get up tomorrow and try not to have such anger in my life. I need to get up tomorrow and I need to just look to the sun and sit in the presence of Christ and declare that today is a day that I'm coming through you and I need your strength, Lord. I cannot live this life on my own. Next week we'll talk about how to build our life, but I feel like it's fitting that for two weeks we've kind of ended here. The same thing. You can't live the kingdom life on your own. So the choice today is, it's quite simple. Narrow gate or wide gate. Only one's going to result in life. Jesus is the way. Will you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for your word, oh Lord. And there's a lot, a lot to take in. But I thank you, God, that fruit is not necessarily our responsibility. It is a byproduct of where our tree is planted. And Lord, if I'm honest, there's days where I just want to uproot my tree and plant it in the wide gate of pride or religion or morality, but it's never going to work. <laughs> it's not good enough. It's only you, Jesus. And so I pray that you'd free us from leaving here, anyone leaving here, trying to do more. Trying to do better. Trying to get rid of certain fruit and gain other fruit. And God, I pray that you'd help us to leave here fully believing that apart from you, we can do nothing. And unless we abide in you, Jesus, our fruit will never be what we want it to be. So help us stop making excuses for why we're not in your presence, why we're not in your word, why we're not surrendered to you. Help us to stop thinking that through our own effort or our own devices we can be better Christians. This talk is cheap. And our deeds are cheap. What matters is if we know you. And if we know you and we abide in you, we believe, Jesus, that we will do greater things than you did because you said it. So help us, Lord, to enter through that narrow gate.
We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.